First Kings chapter 12. 12 being the number of the tribes of Israel. 12 is a Jewish number. And quite interesting history to chapter 12. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. Now Israel brings him. Solomon's died in chapter 11. So they bring Rehoboam to Shechem, and he's made king by the people. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, this was going to be an adversary of Solomon, in a prophecy spoken about in chapter 11, who was yet in Egypt for the fear of Solomon, heard it, for he had fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt, that they sent and called him. And Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father, Solomon, made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke, which he put upon us, lighter. That's the first time lighter shows up. And he will serve thee. So Solomon had, had a levy. He had a taxation. He had men drawn to, to timber and stones. and It was a lot of work to build that temple and all his houses, and the walls in the cities. And what's coming to now is, here's the new king, the new king, the new rulership. We want a little easement here. We want it to be a little lighter. And he sent him to depart yet for three days. Interesting number of all the Bible. Three days. And come again to me, and the people depart. So, all right, I heard what you said. Come back in three days. And King Rehoboam, Solomon's son, consulted, that's the first time that word shows up, with the old man. That's a good place, shows up with the old man. That stood before Solomon, his father, while he, was yet, while he yet lived. Remarkable. And said, how do ye advise that I may answer this people? <laughs> a little tongue in the cheek, a little attitude there. How about not the children of God? How about not the children of Israel? This people. And they did be the wise men, the old men. They spank on them saying, If that will be a servant unto this people this day, and will serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, politician, then they will be thy servants forever. The king to do service to the people. And not the people doing the service to the king. As was Solomon's situation. Solomon had everybody working for him. And the, and the old man say, listen, you know, you got to put a little effort to the people too now. you got to do things for them. It's not just sit high and mighty on the throne and look down upon the people. But you got to help them. They need help. When, when we put people in Washington, D.C., you know, this lecture time, you never see who they are. And if you do see them, you're not going to see them again to the next election. And they're going to promise all these things to you, but they don't care about you. And we come from a government now of King Solomon. It was work, 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 work. Well, the houses are built. The walls are done. What else are you going to do? But he forsook the counsel of the old men, which they have given him, and consulted with the young men that were growing up with him, his, his class people, the people that were in the same school with him, the people he grew up with, his buddies, people who don't, don't have no sense, have not lived any sense. And we're seeing that today in this world. We are asking children what their thoughts are. We're putting children in leadership. We're... You know, they've got a voice too. They do not. And it's remarkable for me that the fact is that you will see a child write an obituary to the newspaper. That child doesn't know nothing. And one time I wrote an I wrote, not obituary, an editorial. I wrote an editorial against the child writing an editorial and said, that kid doesn't know nothing. He hasn't even got a degree in school yet. And everybody shot me down. These young people don't know nothing. 
They haven't got to experience the old men. Old men that were with Solomon, his father, Solomon had wisdom from God. They had learned some things of Solomon. But watch what the young people would say. And which stood before him, his friends, his buddies. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye that we may we may answer this people? Who has spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. Young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shall you speak unto this people. And that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy. Burden. That's what it is. A yoke is what you put around the animal's neck. It's a big cart back there. It's a big plow. It's too much. But thou make it thou lighter for us, thou shalt say unto them, My little finger. What? Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter for us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, I said, My little finger, that little finger, not much, don't do much, shall be thicker. That's the first time that word shows up. Than my father's loins. The loins is the fattest part of the human body, the most strength part of the body. That helps you get up. That helps you to get along, carry things. And he said, My little finger is going to be more powerful than my father's loins. And now, whereas my father did lead you with heavy yoke, all right, I acknowledge the heavy yoke. It was there. I will add to your yoke. That's not what they want. I will add to your yoke. My father has chastened. First time that word shows up. You with whips. First time whips have shown up. Whips. First time that word shows up. Shows up with chastise. Chastement. And that's what they've done to Jesus Christ. They whipped him. They beat him. And Isaiah 53 says the chastisement of our iniquities was laid upon him. It's an interesting place where those two words first show up. In Isaiah 53, in Jesus Christ. But I will chase, I will chastise you with scorpions. Animals that bite, that do great pain. They have claws, they have stingers. Scorpions will show up in the time of, of Jacob's trouble in the tribulation period. Men shall be hurt for months. I forget how many. And there will be no relief at all. What a vice. Idiotic, stupidity vice to give. This is definitely going to turn the people away. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day, third day, third day, third day. And the king answered the people roughly. So not only to say, listen, okay, yeah, my father made your burden heavy, but my little finger is gonna be as thick as my it's gonna be thicker than my father's loin. I know my father made your burdens. Man, wait till you see what I'm going to do to you. I'm going to add to it. That's not the way to do it. Answer the people roughly. And forsook the old man's counsel that they gave him. So there's nothing peaceable. There's nothing friendly. There's nothing of help. There is no aid. Ever to be mentioned by Rehoboam to the people of Israel. I'm going to be a hard king. And spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy. And he keeps acknowledging. He knows exactly what it was. He's not saying, My father did not do that. Notice that. He says, My father made the yoke heavy. It's there. It's true. And to acknowledge that, I am going to add more. My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. 
I'm going to make it worse. My father also chastised you with whips. I wonder if that's true. Or is that just words that were added? I don't know. But was Solomon whipping the people or having them whipped to do the work? Was there such a heavy burden upon the people? Part of it is acknowledged by the old men. Part of it is acknowledged by the young men. And part of it is acknowledged by Rehoboam. Nowhere does he ever say, that's not what my father did. The old man does, did not say to Rehoboam, say, you know, they got it all wrong. Listen, we were with your father. We were we, we worked with your father. And Baba, it's not... That's not the case. Now, we read in accounts of Solomon that he was nice and gentle to the people of, of the Jews, but to the strangers, maybe, he whipped them. But I will chastise you with scorpions. I'm going to bite you with venom. You very rarely see a scorpion when he comes up. A lot of times, I've been told, they get in the clothes, they get into your bed, they get in places you don't know he's there. And then you'll pass out or, uh, or faint from the venom, from the bite, and somebody else will come and find, you know, what's wrong with this person? Wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people. Today, he wouldn't get no vote. But he's a king. He doesn't need both votes. It's a monarchy. People do not have a voice. They do not have the responsibility of voting the person out of office. If that's the king way he's going to be, that's the king he's going to be to death. America said we will have no king. For the cause was from the Lord. The Lord has caused all this. The Lord has caused uh, Rehoboam to listen to the young men. The old men's counsel were proper and right. But since God told Solomon, hey, I got three adversaries for you. And then when we meet uh, Jeroboam for the first time, Ahijah shows up. He takes his garment, rips it in 12 pieces, and says, here, you take 10. God is going to rent, he's going to rent the kingdom, 10 tribes away from Rehoboam, the son of, of Solomon. And this is what's happening right now. In order for that to happen, Rehoboam has to take the wrong advice from the wrong people for God to get the work done. And there are weird things when it comes to the government that people need to realize that God will use. Here's a substance over the authority of a king to break the kingdom in half. As he said, in order to get Jesus Christ born where he was supposed to be born, he had to send Roman taxation. He had to call the Romans and say, all Jewish people go back to the house of your lineage. And Joseph never, Joseph never revealed Rebuked the government, never revolted, never went to a tea party. He went down to the city of Bethlehem like he was supposed to. I guarantee he did whatever they needed to do and pay what he needed to pay. And then boom, Mary gives birth to her firstborn. And what we see, the thing is, if you were a Jew right now, and you are standing before King Rehoboam, and you just heard the declaration of, of King Rehoboam, you probably got angry, you probably... Man, you're fed up, you're tired, you feel. But what you did not know, what you have no idea is, that it, it behind the play is God. Now, if you get a ruler or a leader that does something, or you don't like that leader or that ruler, and you have opposed the government, you don't know what God's doing behind the scenes. This king says, all right, you're going to get worse treatment. I guarantee the people did not like that. I guarantee the people got upset. But God is now using this opportunity to do prophecy. 
Wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord, that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spanked by Ahijah, the Shilonite, that's chapter 11, unto Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So it's prophecy. A hated king. After those words, he would be hate hated. But God's behind the scenes. We want the rapture. We want the... You might be interfering with the rapture by your attitude to the government. Just shut up and do what the Bible says. Pray for the people and leaders. Witness to the people. And the... Get off the other nonsense. Name calling and all that. And then the people, you know, they, they call these politicians names. They make fun of them. But when somebody makes fun of that person, and they call that person, and they put that person, they don't like it. Verse 16, so when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, or right, here's a reaction. The people answered the king, saying, What portion have we with David, Judah? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. That would be the ten tribes. Now see to thine own house, David, Judah. So Israel departed unto their tents. Now we're getting a split here. Not ready yet. A few more verses. But Israel's like, David, Judah, we have no part in you. We're Israel. You're David. What did you just do to us? We're sick and tired of David. We're sick and tired of Solomon. We're sick and tired of you. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. So there's still there, there's a division in the government already. Rehoboam's in charge of Judah. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the tribute taxes. Tribute is you owe me money for protection, for means, for the government providing you a way you, you got to pay for it. And all Israel stoned it with stones. The, guy, the tax man came. They hated him. He came from Rehoboam. They stoned him. They put him to death. That is a Jewish capital punishment. They tried that with Jesus many times. They hated the tax man. We read today as a family. Jesus picks up Levi or Matthew. And then the next thing you know, he makes a feast for Jesus. And everybody, you know you sit with those people for? Ew. Politicians and sinners, them people. Well, that's how Rehoboam answered. How do I answer these people? Mm. Nose up in the air. But Rehoboam now, he sends out a government. Hey, you got to pay taxes. Taxes help. When we drive on blacktop roads, when we get water delivered to our house, we've got, you know, things done by the government. We got parks and wrecks and that comes from taxes. Taxes pay for the city. The police force that you call, the fire department that you may need or not need, that's taxes. They stoned the tax guy. America did that with the, in the, in the, the oh, I can't think of what it's called out there. Boston Tea Party in the harbor. The tea tax. They dumped all the tea off into the river. That's stupid. That he died. Therefore King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot and to flee to Jerusalem. So he's with the tax man. He is going into Israel, the ten territories. And then he finds out his man has been killed. He's been stoned. I'm next. He gets in that chariot and he heads back to the capital. Now verse 19. Mark this, mark this verse somehow. B.C. 931. So Israel vowed against the house of David, David, Judah, unto this day. B.C. 931. And they have not been together since. Now who will join them to be in unity will be Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ gets on his horse, not chariot, when he gets on his horse and heads to Jerusalem. Then he's going to bring the two nations together. And it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, 
that they sent and called him unto the congregation and made him king over all Israel. Now you have two kings, you have a split kingdom. You have kingdom north, Israel. Kingdom south, Judah. North and south, now on. Right now, Jeroboam is the king of the north. Rehoboam is the king of the, of the south. There was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. And that, that would be also Benjamin and Simeon. But they have been sucked up into Judah. So we got a split now. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin. There they are. A hundred and four score thousand chosen men, which were warriors. That's the first time that word shows up and only shows up in 2 Chronicles 11.1, 1, which is the same context we're reading now. 2 Chronicles 11.1, 1, the first time warriors. To fight against the house of Israel. The first actual silver, silver war of the north and south has now happened. Nor, um, south Judah is going to fight north Israel. To bring kingdom back to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. I'm going to take them by force. But the word of God came unto Shemaniah, the man of God, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and unto the house of Judah, saying, Benj and Benjamin, together, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Look how God said, Children of Israel there, Judah here. Return every man to his house. For this thing is of me. I split the nation. You better keep it split. Put your military away. Everybody go home. Don't you interfere with me. You better be careful when you're dealing with governments. When you got governments, you got God and you got Satan. Matthew 4, Luke 4. Don't interrupt in place where because David didn't know who numbered. One place said God caused David a number, the other place says Satan caused him a number. He said, This is of me. And the Lord said, Ye shall not go up to, nor fight against your brethren the children of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing is of from me. They hearkened therefore to the word of the Lord. And return to depart according to the word of the Lord. All right. Now, never in the scriptures does Israel North ever get right and do right. And this is where it begins. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim. That's north. And dwelt there. So this is where he will have his capital. And went out from thence and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, he's talking to himself. He's thinking to himself, not out loud. Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. Uh-oh, got a problem here. You know what's going to happen? They're going to assert my authority and they're going to go back to Rehoboam. Time will heal all wounds. i got to stop it. So what's he doing? If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, if they go to Jerusalem as the law prescribed, that's what he's saying. Passover, Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Trumpet, Pentecost. When God sent the law, when you go to Jerusalem, this is what he's talking about. When the people of Israel are going to do right by the law, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto the Lord. When they go back to Jerusalem, they're going to go back to Jerusalem. They're going to go back to Rehoboam. He's got fear. 
And already you don't need to read any further. You can see trouble is brewing now. Then shall the heart of this people turn again unto the Lord. And that's not the big capital L-O-R-D. That's Rehoboam. Even unto Rehoboam, the king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, the king of Judah. So my kingdom's in trouble. My life is on the, is on the neck right now. These people are going to go back and do what God told them to do. There's one place for the feast. There's one place to gather. That's Jerusalem. And when they go back and do what God has told them to do, they're going to kill me. And they're going to go back and be this one nation again. And in presumption terms to be is, I can't have this happen. Whereupon, the king took counsel. And we don't know with who or what is not mentioned. He took counsel. And from that counsel, he made two golden calves of gold. Me, he made two calves of gold. So now, already, we have idolatry has crept into Israel north. I am going to solve the problem of Israel getting right with God. I'm going to make two cows of gold. And said unto them, I assume the people, or maybe he's talking to his cows, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. What did the law say? The law said go to Jerusalem. Now he has violated the law by he's made two idols. Now he's going to violate the law by, you don't need to go to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, small g-o-d-s, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Exodus 32.4. Exodus 32.4. Quite interesting. History repeats itself. And we'll start in 32.2. 32.2. And Aaron said unto, unto them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in your ears of your wives, of your sons. Oh, look at that. The males are wearing earrings then. And of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at his hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool. After he made it a molten calf, one, one calf, one golden calf, and they said, watch this, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Let's go back over here to 1 Kings. Let's see what Rehoboam said. He makes two golden calves. And he says, O Israel, which brought, he said, yeah, behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Nothing's new. Nothing's changed. We're going right back in a big circle. That's what Aaron did. And if you go back and read Exodus 32 and 33, you tell that God told Moses, you better get down there. I'm going to kill him. They're dead. And Moses starts walking down the mountain. He meets Joshua. And Joshua's like, there's a war going on down there. Man, they're getting killed. Moses picks up his ear. He says, that don't sound like war. That don't sound like anybody's getting killed. It doesn't sound like anybody's getting no victory. It's not like the voice of singing I hear. And they come down off that mountain. And there's the great BBS youth group night. <laughs> Dancing around, the Bible says. And having a good old time of fellowship of eating and drinking and playing. Guess what Jeroboam has done? And I wonder, I am not sure because I cannot, because it doesn't tell us. But what was that council that matched what Aaron did in Exodus 32? Because it's almost the same exact words. These be the gods which brought you out of Egypt. Verse 29. 
He set one in Bethel. Now this will be this, the religious center of Israel. And one of the minor prophets is spoken about come to Bethel and transgress. And that's sarcasm by God. He didn't mean it. But he's being sarcastic. Now come to they're coming to Bethel to transgress. Remember what Jacob, when he named Bethel, where he's sleeping there, and he sees the angels going up and down on that ladder, he meets God very for the first time. He says, I had no idea that this is the house of God. Beth, house, El, God. The house of God. And he puts one of them calves there. And then he goes with the other one. He said, he said, he said the one in Bethel and the other put he and Dan, that's the most northern territory of Israel, Dan. Dan is that tribe that says like unto the tribe of Israel. Dan is described as the Antichrist. Dan is the first one born by proxy of Rachel saying, Jacob, here, take my handmaid. Dan is missing out 144,000. And Dan now has the other calf. Dan means judge. Daniel means God is my judge. So he has taken these two calves and broke them in one, and now they're in two places. You don't have to go down to Jerusalem no more. As far as that God in Jerusalem, that's not him. It's that golden calf that brought you out. I can go to the Old Testament. We can open up to, in, in Exodus, and I can show you where Aaron the high priest said. These be the gods that brought you out of Egypt. Chapter and verse. Be careful how you quote the scriptures because you can apply the scriptures wrong. That's a called a cult in religion. Verse 30. Look what God has to say about the Holy Spirit. And thus, I'm excuse me, and this thing, the gods, small g-o-d-s, the calves, became a sin. You will find that quite often. Um, and just go over one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. At least 13, 14 times that it became a sin. It's mentioned about these golden calves. It became a sin. For the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. So he made two of them. There's one in Bethel, there's one in Dan, but they preferred the one in Dan more. So we got that one golden cow. But there's two. But the preference went to the one up north. All right, ready? We're not done yet. The date here is BC 975, and it's good as any date. Because you're going to come across people that say, well, our religion was founded upon Christ and the Apostles. Alright? You're going to pick on a religion. Yes, I'm going to. I have to. Because i got to show you the truth. The gods in Bethel and Dan has become a convenience. You don't need to go to Jerusalem. Now watch what he does. About 975 B.C. And he made a house of high places. So on hills and mountains and big steeples big towers. He made churches. Multiple churches. In honor of the calves. So you can go worship in other places for the great calf. Maybe there was a drive through And made priests of the lowest of the people which were not of the sons of Levi. Do you know any priest class of people who are not Jewish, who are not of Levi? Catholic, Pentecostal, and all them. Uh, Episcopal. You know that lowest people? I have seen the copy, but I don't have it. But I've seen a replica. That the Catholic Church at one time, I don't remember what the date was, advertised in a magazine for men to become priests. And that magazine was Playboy. Now, that's not the lowest. You can go to the lowest to find men to be called into your ministry where they're told not to marry. Kind of interesting. 
So here are non-Levitical priests in houses of worship. 975 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Never mind the ministry of Jesus Christ. You have priests running around that are not authorized to be priests. Let's go even further. 32. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month. Uh, Lent. It's not in the Bible. Mardi Gras is not in the Bible. Easter is not in the Bible. You say, well, no, I'm not talking about as far as we Christians are to follow. Christmas is not a Bible identification for a holiday for us. Ash Wednesday is not a Bible doctrine for Christians. Those are made up feasts. And we see a man who's got his own priest, he's got his own church, he's got a bunch of cows. I think the expression is holy cow. And he has designed his own feast day. See, God has Passover, God has Pentecost, God has Trump, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Tabernacles, God has the Sabbath day, God has the new moon, but we've got Lent. We've got Ash Wednesday. We got our own. We have separated ourselves from God 975 years before Jesus Christ is born. Don't let that church tell you, oh, I found it upon Christ and the apostles. It shows up before the Christ. It shows up before the apostles, long before it. The eighth month on the 15th day of the month, like unto the feast that's in Judah. So it's like God's feast, but it's our feast. And he offered upon the altar. Oh, he's got his own altar. They have an altar. And if you're a good Catholic, you and your bride-to-be can be married at the altar. If you're not a good Catholic, you, are, you step outside the altar. But here's the holy altar. Here's where, you know, the magic spells come down and, and that bread and the mass and all that junk. Well, see, we have an altar. They have an altar. Now, we're in the Old Testament here. And he offered upon the altar. He's got his own brazen altar offering animal sacrifices as they did in Jerusalem. So he's got imitation blood that does not match the blood of the Old Testament set forth by God, set forth by the law. He's got other blood. Maybe he has a blood that, you know, he can hocus pocus and a drink becomes blood. Maybe something like that. I don't know. Maybe he's got intoxicating blood. But he doesn't have the blood of the goats, the, the oxen, and the lamb. And he sure will not have the blood of the Lamb of God which take away the sin of the world. So did he, so did he in Bethel. So see, Bethel now has become the center point of all the religious authority of Jeroboam. Do you know a particular church that has a center point of all their religious activity where it looks like a boot? <laughs> where God will give them the boot. 975 years approximately, I, I, I see that's a good date, before Christ is ever born. You've got the Catholic Church here, and we can go back to the book of Judges, and we can find a priest in there. He makes his own terrorism. He, he's hired. He's called a father in Judges. Don't go with this nonsense that that church is after Christ. It's in the Old Testament, and it has nothing to do with God. So did he in Bethel, house of God. That's what Bethel means. Be very careful today when you call your church the house of God because it may not be the house of God. I'll tell you how you know that your church, your Baptist church in particular, is not the house of God. I'll tell you right now. How do you know it? Are there lost people in your congregation? Then it's not the house of God because only saved people. That day when the church is raptured, that will be the house of God. Individuals, not nails, not bricks, not wood, not glass, not stone. But the people who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ since the apostles, 
since Christ has rose from the grave. Those that are gathering together, that will be the church. Upon this rock I will build my church, and he's not talking about bricks and stones. But there are people who have the house of God. There's the house of God right now, and he's got a false God. He's got moo moo gods. Great cows. Beef. Hamburger joint. So he did in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves. Not God, to the calves. Oh, great calves. Here's some ketchup and mustard. I don't know what he did. <laughs> I don't know what you give a cow. Here's some hay. That he had made. Who had made? Jeroboam. God didn't make it. He made it. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So there's those priests worshiping gods. And if you're in the Old Testament, the name would be Baal. They maybe they would have little rings around their horns. So he offered upon the altar which he had made. No, he had made. He had made. He had made. It had nothing to do with God. In Bethel, the 15th day of the 8th month. Even in the month which he had devised of his own heart. That was verse 26. Remember, he communed with his own heart. Man, he thought of this all up. And ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, north. And he offered upon the altar and burnt the incense. And you can find that in the Catholic Church. That's When I was growing up in Catholic Church, little boy, man, I'd start sneezing. i start, <laughs> that stuff stunk. When they come walking down the aisle, swinging that thing and all that. The great holy cow. 